how to do moth camouflage experiments right. The book Icons of Evolution came out in uh, 2000 by Jonathan Wells, senior fellow at the Discovery Institute, graduated from Berkeley, interestingly enough has two separate PhDs, discovered that embryos did not look like his textbook illustrations. His PhD was at first in embryology. And uh, he started exploring other standard examples that are used in the textbook to support evolution, uh, usually represented pictorially. Uh, they could be called paradigms if you want, but um, because they're represented pict pictorially, it kind of fit to call them icons. And so he wrote Icons of Evolution. And of course, Jonathan Wells is somewhat of an iconoclast. That's Greek for somebody who breaks up idols. The um, list that he had includes 10. Uh, right now, we're going to concentrate on the peppered moths. Um, peppered moths in Darwin's day, no one had seen natural selection actually work. It was hypothesized. It was reasonable that it could work, but they didn't actually have proof that it worked. In 1898, Herman Bumpus noted that English sparrows after a snowstorm died. Some of them survived, and the ones that survived tended to be small males. And why that was was not clear, but differential survival raised the question of maybe um, there is some selection pressure of some kind, um, and snowstorms uh, might be part of it for English sparrows. Um, peppered moths were mostly light colored when observation was first recorded. During the Industrial Revolution, peppered moths in general, um, not everywhere specifically, and we're going to talk about that, but in general they became darker. Uh, Bernard Kettlewell, a British physician, performed some experiments. Um, he released moths in, uh, during the day and they landed on tree trunks. And the light-colored moths were more likely to be eaten uh, because the trees in the area were darker. And he wrote this up as natural selection at work, and this has become kind of a classic. It's used in most biology textbooks, or was in 2000. We're going to follow up with that. In 1850, most peppered moths were mostly light gray with a few black scales. By 1900, boy, that's stuck. 90% um, of those around Manchester were mostly dark. Similar changes were noted in other species of moths, ladybird beetles, and some birds. Other industrial cities, such as Birmingham and Liverpool, also had more dark species in general and more dark uh, peppered moths in particular. In 1896, J.W. Tutt suggested that differences in camouflage might be the cause. In the 1920s, J.W. Heslop Harrison suggested that maybe it's not really um, differences in camouflage so much as the direct result of the pollutants themselves. Um, the infect is definitely inherited. Light-colored moths tend to produce light-colored uh, descendants and melanotic or uh, melanic moths tend to produce melanic descendants. And Kettlewell released the moths and he watched and the birds tended to eat the peppered moths. Um, well, first of all, they ate the moths in, uh, in particular, so that's a possible way of, of showing that it could work. And then it ate the more conspicuous ones to his uh, view. And um, he released moths in Birmingham and allowed them to go wherever and then recaptured moths later on using a, a light, which does a very nice job of capturing moths. And um, a higher percentage of the dark moths was recaptured than the light moths. So basically what he did is mark the underside of the wings 
why it wouldn't interfere with uh, um, with any camouflage that might be developing or might be there. And then when he recaptured him, he recaptured a certain percentage of the light moths and a certain percentage of the dark moths. And it was a higher percentage of dark moths that he recaptured. Presumably that meant that the higher, that the dark moths uh, survived better. He repeated the experiment in Dorset, which uh, has primarily light-colored trees, and the opposite results were obtained. Uh, and this was proclaimed as uh, Darwin's missing evidence, and uh, therefore made its way into the textbooks and uh, is with us um, uh, two, ten years ago. Uh, Anti-pollution laws reversed the colors of the tree trunks, that is to say there was not as much black soot on the tree trunks and the lichens tended to live more. And uh, so at that point the light moths started to predominate, at least that was the story. And uh, so you had not only natural selection, but reversible natural selection. It's a classic textbook example. It comes complete with pictures, and here's a, a good example of a picture. If you look over here, and you're looking for a moth, if you didn't have this red ring, you'd have a hard time picking out the light-colored moth. On the other hand, if you look over here at the darker tree, you can pick out the melanotic and melanic moth, but it's not as easy to see as the light-colored moth. And those are the kinds of camouflage we're talking about. Now, th there's problems with the evidence. Uh, melanic moths did not completely replace the ordinary ones in polluted areas and didn't even reach 99.99%, which is what you'd kind of expect if uh, there is continual differential um, uh, predation. Uh, rural whales had too many melanics without a change in tree trunk color. Um, for what it's worth, rural whales is out, this is whales right in this area. And um, there's where Manchester is, where the experiments were first done, but it's true, Liverpool, which is about here, and Birmingham, which is about there. Um, and uh, East Anglia, the normals were better camouflaged, but you still had more melanic moths. So that raises some interesting questions. In South Wales, the melanics are better camouflaged, the trees are darker, but the, um, um, but the normals still predominate. So, you know, it's not completely adding up uh, to be quite as neat and tidy as the textbooks would have you believe. Uh, after anti-pollution legislation, the melanics actually increased in the south of uh, England. Now, Kettlewell noted on the Wirral Peninsula that melanism decreased before lichens regrew. In other words, the melanism, uh, you started to get more of the light-colored moths on the dark trees, and then they grew lichens which doesn't make uh, completely physiologic sense. The Wirral Peninsula is this little thing right over here near Liverpool. And uh, that's East Anglia, and of course this is the south of England. Um, Kettlewell released his moths during the day, and the moths uh, basically uh, fluttered to the nearest tree trunk and sat there resting because they go torpid during the day. Um, moths do not normally rest on the tree trunks. If you're looking for them uh, without somebody releasing them, you don't find them there. Uh, they rest somewhere, obviously, but it's not on the tree trunks. Um, the photographs that were there were done staged to make it look nice. Sometimes they were glued on, sometimes they were pinned on or they were put there and then they stayed because they were torpid and they didn't move around very much. And um, it's supposed to show the true cause of melanism. 
um, but in fact the cause is under dispute. Now that's not to say that the idea isn't a good one. It's not to say that it won't maybe eventually turn out to be the largest part of the answer. Um, but what you can say, I think, with some confidence that it isn't the whole answer. Uh, Jerry Coyne, uh, who's an evolutionist uh, at the University of Chicago and well known in evolutionist uh, circles for being an anti-creationist, said, quote, the prized horse in our stable of examples is in bad shape and while not yet ready for the glue factory needs serious attention. Um, Bruce Grant acknowledges the problems, but he said, yet Grant claims that Kettlewell's results are valid anyway. There is indisputable evidence for natural selection, he argues, because even if all the experiments related to melanism and peppered moths were jettisoned, we would still possess the most massive data set on record for a conspicuous evolutionary change. Grant concludes that no other evolutionary force can explain the direction, velocity, and magnitude of the changes except natural selection. Now, that may be true. Um, uh, but it isn't necessarily how birds see the moths in their natural condition. Evidence for industrial melanism, however, is not necessarily evidence for natural selection and is certainly not evidence that the selective agents were predatory birds. As we saw above, melanic forms might survive better in a polluted environment for any number of reasons and even biologists who defend the general outline of the classical story acknowledge that, quote, non-visual selective factors, end quote, must also have been involved. No one doubts that a change in the proportion of the two varieties of peppered moth occurred, but what caused it? In 1986, evolutionary biologist John Endler wrote a book entitled Natural Selection in the Wild, now acknowledged to be a classic in the field. At the time, Endler was unaware of the problems being unearthed in the peppered moth story, so he listed it as one of the few cases in which the cause of natural selection was known. But he also declared that, quote, the time has passed for quick and dirty studies of natural selection, end quote. Although most researchers are, in his words, satisfied in the demonstration merely that natural selection occurred, uh, this is equivalent to demonstrating a chemical reaction and then not investigating its causes and mechanisms. A strong demonstration of natural selection combined with a lack of knowledge of its reasons and mechanisms is no better than alchemy, um, which may contain some truth, but you don't understand why. Industrial melanism in peppered moths shows that the relative proportions of two existing uh, pre-existing varieties can change dramatically. This change may have been due to natural selection, as most biologists familiar with the story believe. But Kettlewell's evidence for natural selection is flawed, and the actual causes of the chain change remain hypothetical. As a scientific demonstration of natural selection, as Darwin's missing evidence, industrial melanism in peppered moths is no better than alchemy. Open almost any biology textbook dealing with evolution, however, this was written in 2000, and you'll find the peppered moth presented as a classic demonstration of natural selection in action, complete with faked photos of moths on tree trunks. This is not science, but myth-making in, um, uh, in uh, uh, Wells' book. And he calls it the peppered myth. Almost every textbook that deals with evolution not only retells the classical peppered moth story without mentioning its flaws, but also illustrates it with staged photographs. For example, the 2000 edition of Kenneth Miller and Joseph Levine's, that's the Kenneth Miller that uh, defends Darwin and wrote uh, uh, Finding Darwin's God, include faked photographs of peppered moths on tree trunks and calls Kettlewell's work, quote, a classic demonstration of natural selection and action. To be fair, many of these people read the textbooks themselves and are simply repeating what they were taught in school. 
Similarly, Burton Gutzman's 1999 biology includes the usual photos, summarizes Kettlewell's experiments, and calls the peppered moth, quote, a classic contemporary case of natural selection. Many textbooks repeat the myth that the presence or absence of lichens was a key factor in the story. In his 1998 textbook, Biology, Visualizing Life, George Johnson wrote, Recently, England has re introduced strict air pollution control measures. Forests near industrial centers like Birmingham are once again becoming covered with lichens. Have students predict wh what Kettlewell would find today? The 1998 edition of uh, Starr and Taggart's biology includes the following. In 1952, strict pollution controls went into effect. Lichens made comebacks. Tree trunks became free of soot for the most part. As you might have predicted, directional selection started to operate in the reverse direction. Well, around Manchester it did. Um, other areas, mm, it's a mixed story. A Canadian textbook writer who knew that the peppered moth pictures were staged used them anyway. And this is classic. You have to look at the audience. How convoluted do you want to make it for a first-time learner? <laughs> Maybe the first-time learner should be introduced to the difficulty with science and the fact that it is a little messy. And uh, as they would say, one study is no studies until it's confirmed. Um, Bob Ritter was quoted as saying in the April 5, 1999, Alberta Report News Magazine, high school students, quote, are still very concrete in the way they learn. The advantage of this example of natural selection is that it is extremely visual. Uh, untrue, but at least it looks good. We want to get across the idea of selective adaptation. Later on, they can look at the work critically. And if they go on to physics, they'll believe the biology they learned in high school or in college and uh, will never be introduced to the fact that there's some questions involved. Apparently, the later on can be much later when University of Chicago professor Jerry Coyne learned of the flaws in the classical story in 1998. He was well into his career as an evolutionary biologist. His experience illustrates how insidious the icons of evolution really are, since they mislead even professionals. Coyne was understandably embarrassed when he finally learned that the peppered moth story he had been teaching for years was a myth. Coyne's reaction upon learning the truth reveals the disillusionment that may become increasingly common as biologists discover that the icons of evolution mi misrepresent the truth. My own reaction, he wrote, resembles the dismay attending my discovery at the age of six that it was my father and not Santa who brought the presents on Christmas Eve. Um, since the book has been written, the peppered moth story has largely disappeared from textbooks. I did a quick survey of a few of the ones that were used before and and uh, it just vanished. Um, there's two questions that come out. One of them is, why does it take intelligent design to get the textbooks to correct themselves? Interesting question. Maybe intelligent design, if nothing else, has a good negative function. And then the second question is, why do the textbooks simply omit the story rather than explain its defects? Um, I guess maybe for the, the uh, sake of brevity, but uh, might it be worth our while knowing how science operates sometimes? Of course, that might destroy a little bit of faith in science, but maybe what we need is a realistic faith in science, not a blind one. Um, now, that brings us to the present, uh, or at least to... Um, the Journal of Evolutionary Biology, uh, the 25th volume, and uh, 2012. And uh, 
there was a, a, an article called Camouflage Through an Active Choice of a Resting Spot and Body Orientation in Moths. And this has to do with, do you let the moth position itself or do you position the moth uh, in the way you think it ought to be? And this is just absolutely fascinating. First of all, the abstract itself is kind of interesting. Uh, cryptic color patterns in prey are classical examples of adaptation to provide, avoid predation, but we still know little about behaviors that reinforce the match between animal body and the background. For example, moths avoid predators by matching their color patterns with the background. Active choice of a species-specific body orientation has been suggested as an important function of body positioning behavior performed by moths after landing on bark. In other words, they do their own choosing, not only of the tree, but the spot in the tree where they want to sit. However, the contribution of this behavior to moths' crypticity has not been directly measured, and so they're going to measure it for you. Uh, from observation of uh, geometrid moths, Hypomesis rubberaria and Jankowski fuscaria, we dis determined that the positioning behavior, which consists of walking and turning the body while repeatedly lifting and lowering the wings, resulted in new resting spots and body orientations in those two species and new resting spots uh, in one of them. The body positioning behavior of the two species um, significantly decreased the probability of visual detection by humans who viewed photographs of the moths taken before and after the positioning behavior. Um, in case you missed it, um, there are actually two moths in this background photograph. Uh, and it's reproduced at approximately the uh, uh, well, at the, at the published detail. Uh, you can probably see the left one pretty easily. The right one, good luck. This implies that body positioning significantly increases the camouflage effect provided by moths' cryptic color patterns regarding, regardless of whether the behavior involves a new body orientation or not. Our study demonstrates that the evolution of morphologic adap adap morphological adaptations, such as color patterns of moths, cannot be fully understood without taking into account a behavioral phenotype that co-evolved with the morphology for increasing the adaptive value of the morphologic trait. Uh, what they're basically saying is, you let the moths determine their own resting spot, and they do a better job at matching than humans do. Think about the implications of that. How do they know what they look like? Um, or how are they programmed so that they select the right spots? I'm not, I'm not asking why the ones that select the right spots live longer. I'm asking how, what, kind of, uh, what kind of mechanism can you make to try to understand? Uh, why they picked that in the first place. Would you mind pointing at the moths? Oh, sure. Well, I mean, uh, I yeah. think Mike helps. Oh, OK. Uh, well, I was going to record what you had to say. Uh, yeah, let me, OK. There's, there's the first moth. Most of you probably saw that. OK. And um, the second moth is down here. And if you're having trouble seeing it, that's because you are. In just a bit, we'll, we'll see a photograph where it's pointed out a little better. Uh, and then... Um, um, I'm just taking your word for it, but I, I'm not the wiser after you pointed <laughs> it out. <laughs> um, evolution of adaptations through natural selection is a central theory in biology, yes. And the cryptic city of moths, that's how well they hide, the morphological phenotype, what they look like, has been the icon of morph... Notice they use the term icon. Um, of morphological adaptations to avoid predation throughout the history of evolutionary biology. And they give some references, including Kettlewell's experiments, of course. Um, most non-toxic and non-mimetic moths, that is to say, if they aren't poisonous and they don't look like something else that is poisonous, 
are inconspicuous in their natural habitat due to color patterns on their wings that provide camouflage when the moths rest in species-specific spites. And they give some references. Whereas morphological aspects of uh, crypsis, such as disruptive cor uh, coloration and background matching pattern, have attracted the attention of researchers, some crucial aspects of behavioral adaptations are poorly understood. That is how they actually behave. The importance of previously unexplored aspects of behavior in moth crypticity has become apparent in recent discussions. And uh, notice uh, Majerus who defended the, uh, the uh, peppered moth and then Wells 2000, that's Icons of Evolution. Of Kettlewell's classic research, which they cite, as well as in popular attempts to criticize the evolution as a scientific dis uh, discipline. To be fair, the, the term the sounds a little odd, but if you're South Korean, it doesn't sound quite as odd. Um, and, um, uh, they're citing Wells and, and Hooper in 2003. Now, the interesting thing of it is Wells, is Wells is being classified as a popular attempt to criticize evolution as a scientific discipline. Uh, interesting perspective on that. Although the preference of moths for landing on substrates gen that generally re resemble the moth's color has been well studied, and um, there's actually even a, uh, a uh, paper by Kettlewell and Kahn, it alone cannot explain how the final cryptic match between the patterns on the moth's wings and the patterns in the background, such as tree bark, is achieved. This is because of the landing spots and body orientation at the moment of and immediately after landing on a trunk are different from the spots and body orientations which the moths finally rest on a substrate. And um, the final resting positions and orientations which result from body positioning behaviors after landing are species specific. Each species has its own little habits and have been hypothesized to be key adaptations to achieve crypticity, that is to hide. The positioning behavior is more crucial than the general preference for a trunk coloration, although that is true too, because even if a moth landed on a bark with coloration or pattern different from its own, the behavioral positioning may in principle lead to considerable crypsis through disruptive coloration or matching between the wing and background patterns. Therefore, the positioning behaviors performed by moths after landing are, essentially to, uh, are essential to account for the almost perfect match between the pattern on the moth wings and the pattern on the bark. However, the body positioning behavior has only been approached from the proximal perspective, and no direct test of an adaptive role of this behavior has been conducted. And so they're doing this. Although in his classical experiment, Kettlewell, uh, used wild birds to measure the detectability of live moths after the moths landed on neutral su natural substrates. The experimental paradigm that has been employed for over the last 50 years has been summarized as an experimenter arranges the prey, a predator attempts to detect it. Researchers use specimens pinned onto a tree trunk, a tree bark, or photographs thereof or images copy-pasted onto a tree bark image in body orientations chosen by the experimenter based on knowledge of how the moths position their bodies, which hopefully is good, but might not be. This paradigm ignores that the moths may choose landing spots in a bark differently from, than humans do. This paradigm also ignores that the moths, after landing, actively search for a suitable resting spot, and that the body orientation and nature function is as an adaptation for camouflage only when matched with the natural behavior to seek the resting spot. And of course, if the natural behavior was the reverse, then they might even stand out more. An additional consequence of this typical experimental paradigm was inability to realistically imitate the variation in body orientations of the moth and the choice of the resting spot. We decided to switch back to the experimental paradigm originally proposed by Kettlewell. A moth positions itself, a predator attempts to detect it. We focused on measuring the direct consequences of moth behavior in the natural habitat. 
rather than artificially arranging mods in positions that are believed to imitate the naturally achieved resting spots and orientation. We allowed the mods to do this for us. We're going to have some video of that in just a bit if it works. Um, to determine whether moths' positioning behavior after landing increases their crypticity, we studied two moths and they list them with wings that resemble color patterns of a tree bark. And this is when they tried to allow people to pick it out. You will notice that, that um, there was a significant number of people that couldn't even find the moth. Um, and people were able to pick it out faster um, by a small margin uh, if, if, they, uh, if it was where the moth initially lay, uh, landed than where the moth finally landed. And uh, here's, here's some photographs. Here's an initial uh, moth, and you can see it, I think, pretty easily, although it's still yeah, it's fairly well camouflaged, but then when it actually lands, look at that. There's the outline of where it is now transferred back over to there. That's pretty good, I gotta say. Here's the moth as it initially landed, which is kind of transverse, and and then again, if you don't know that you're supposed to be looking right here, there's the moth outline. It's really tough to see. Um, here's another example. Now this is the natural photographs. Uh, in a little bit they're going to show you the uh, photographs again, but this time uh, it will be with the lighting of adjusted so it's the same lighting. Just because, you know, it's not fair to if the lighting is better. I mean, you can see uh, this one stands out maybe a little bit. Once it gets into the crack in the bark, it's virtually impossible. By the way, some of the moths actually wedged their part of their wings underneath cracks in the bark so that you couldn't see the whole mouth outline. And then it really gets tough. But they don't show that. They're only showing the ones that are full on that you can actually see. And here's. Again, this is, this is with the lighting adjusted, and uh, you may recognize this as the photo that was the background. Um, and and uh, in fact, there are arrows that I had to Photoshop out of the picture. Um, and uh, there you can see, it, the arrow is pointing to it, it's there, but boy. Um, here's a, another example of, this is the natural lighting photographs, and uh, again, it's really well hidden. Uh, and here's the, once they adjust the, uh, the lighting to match, uh, you can see that uh, it becomes extremely cryptic, very hard to see. Now. Um, this is the background, and, and in fact, if you look very carefully, you'll see that there's the remnants of an arrow right there. And there's the remnants of another arrow that I couldn't quite Photoshop away down here. But again, <laughs> you'd have a hard time finding it. Now I'm going to... Um, uh, see if I can show this here. Uh, they're going to release the moth, and um, they had to kind of nudge it out a little bit. The moth landed, and if you look at it, you can s see the moth right in there. Keep watching. Um, that was 14 seconds out. Now this is a minute out, and you watch, and it's going to start moving. Now it's tougher, but wait. About 28 minutes later, or 13 minutes later, decides that that's not good enough. 
So oh then, <laughs> take a look. Isn't that amazing? Well, obviously, it has a spirit behind it, looking out to see where it fits the best. <laughs> you just look at it and you go. Anyway. So that's one, and here's another one. This only has to move once to really get into, uh, into shape. And again, they're going to release it. It's going to flutter down under the tree trunk, and they'll zoom in on it so you get a good look at it. And uh, then wait uh, 28 minutes in this case. This is the 28-minute one. Let's see if I can... There. Oh, man. <laughs> How does it know? Yes. Just, I mean, you look at that and you go, boy, where's Waldo? No. Yes, even when you know it's good. Anyway. Um, Go back to. Um, serve a purpose? Sure. <laughs> they uh, they have beauty in and of themselves. So. Now, personally, I have no personal objection to natural selection as a real force. I believe, among other things, that there's a good reason why polar bears are white and arctic foxes are white and ptarmigans are white and varying hairs in the winter are white and it does have to do with how well they can hide. Um, the peppered moth story, if true, would not establish me mega evolution. This is not a make or break thing. What we are asking for, though, is I think it is more important to be honest than to support anyone's theories. And I would add, including my own theories. I think the creationists need to be very careful not to repeat this kind of thing. And I think there have been a few times that we have. Anyway, now there's with the, um, with the um, arrows not photoshopped chopped out so you can see the, whoops, I was going to leave that on. Um, ah, let's try it this way. There we go. Um, and you can see this, this one, if you didn't have the arrow, I think you'd be hunting forever looking for that thing. Um, and with that, I will uh, open the floor to discussion. I'll let you hold it for now. What's wrong oh, with the word hin instinct? Well, we don't know what instinct is. Um, is Reprogram. Is instinct some kind of program that, uh, that uh, lets the moth figure out that this is a really good spot? Um, is instinct uh, something that, that uh, God gives to them at the time that doesn't have a specific mechanism? Uh, and the, the fact of the matter is that we don't know. We'd like to assume the former, uh, especially in science. Uh, some of that stuff is so uncanny one is tempted to go for the latter. Uh, yes. Just a question about the experiment. 
Uh, did they? How many samples did they have? Did they have? Uh, you can, you know, look at a hundred models landing on a tree. You can pick out two of them. They'll really uh, be impress you. Uh, are you confident that uh, they had some kind of statistical control on um, what they showed us in the video, or uh, at least the, the data of the experiment uh, seemed to show some of some. some. I, I didn't get the size of the populations there, but at least they they, they did more than two samples. Obviously, they they did way more than two samples. They. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, probably a, a hundred or so from from reading the the paper. Um, now I wouldn't doubt that that their videos that they have were two of the better videos they had. Some of that probably had to do with how well the the, the uh, moths hid, which is cherry picking to a slight extent. Some of them. Uh, probably had to do with how well the video equipment was working that day. And some of the moths apparently would travel halfway around a trunk to find the best spot. Uh, you, you saw them just moving, uh, you know, no. an inch or so. But Were they crawling on the trunk? Uh, you know, the, the eyes of a moth are near its head or on its head. Uh, how big a field can they see? Uh, well, it does raise some interesting questions as to how they pick spots that well. Um, go ahead, Lenore. Well, uh, the other thing is, how does the moth know what the design is on the wings? I mean, there's. There's a certain self-awareness that seems to be indicated there, and I thought only human beings had self-awareness. Uh, uh, well, you certainly have the appearance of self-awareness. Now, to be fair, we have designed computers that, as far as we know, are not self-aware, but can occasionally fool people because their responses are lifelike enough that uh, that you think that uh, there's actually some intelligence there, whereas it's designed in but not actually functioning in the machine itself, as, at least as far as we know. Uh, we probably have two alternatives. One is the Holy Spirit watches every moth and directs it to the proper spot. The other one is that God designed some very intricate way for uh, the moths to, uh, to find the best spot. Uh, Without ever actually understanding exactly how that works. Right. Uh, I'm inclined to think that the latter option is probably the right one because, I mean, God is busy taking care of the entire universe and uh, <laughs> I think he he is as smart, at least, as people when design computers. Computers do automatically what they, they were designed to do. And we try to make computers, I mean, my computer is a hundred times better behaved than the first one I had. Which means human beings have been very intelligent after hard work. They, they are designing better ways of Autom how to s how do you Aut in autom automation mm -hmm. so that uh, it requires less work oh I agree um, you know I have a computer that uh, um, most of you do too I'm sure that uh, will underline words in red if they're misspelled and I it's do very too. useful um, and in fact um, at work, I have a, a program called Dragon that will actually take dictation. Um, occasionally, it makes mistakes, and you realize that it's not quite as smart as it sounds. <laughs> let me let me share with you. Uh, I agree with you. Let me share with you my latest experience uh, with computers. 
I, 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 got, I got so tired of having to type my password and my, what's the other name? Password ID. Because it was a long one. And I said, it must be a better way, but I didn't know it existed. And a friend of mine, one day, he was with his computer, he, he just turned the computer on, uh, clicked on the, an icon, and all his emails were right there, mm -hmm. immediately. Mm -hmm. I said, how do you do that? He says, well, it's, it's the program. I said, do you think I can do this with my computer? He says, well, you better. I, I'm sure the program is there. So I decided to look for it, and I found it. Now I don't have to type my ID and long ID and password. I, I made a long ID to make sure nobody would, uh, how do you say, uh, imitate it. Yes. And uh, so now, now my life is much easier. And I think God is at least as intelligent as human beings. Uh, that's a safe bet. Um, just, just to catch up, I, I may have missed the very beginning. So what actually happened with the peppered moth story from what I recall, the peppered moth on tree trunks was questioned because the peppered moth didn't actually land on tree trunks. As that's, far as that's the number arguments one. were. Number, yes, two, number two, although in general, they got darker with uh, industrial melanism. Right. And they, then they got lighter when the pollution was cleaned up, that there were areas where that didn't work for various reasons. Uh, some places they came back light colored before the lichens grew in the tree where they could hide well. Uh, some areas, uh, uh, they got, they stayed light and, and then got darker after the pollution started to be cleaned up. Some areas, they, um, they stayed light in spite of pollution. So did they, was the issue of those moths and tree trunks settled? Well, what's happened is that I think most people who study it realize it's a little more complicated than just dark trees, dark moths, light trees, light moths. And Where do those peppered moths actually rest? And so the interesting thing of it is, as soon as it became more complicated, rather than explaining to people that this happened in some areas, but that there were other areas where and we're still looking for the truth, uh -huh. which would have been a great lesson in science, I think, that it's uh, sometimes not quite as easy as it sounds. What happened was that the textbooks simply made the, the um, whole subject disappear. I read some place that they rest under the tree. Well, there, there's... Uh, I don't think anybody's really determined exactly where. I think that uh, that uh, that's one hypothesis that has some support. But it's like, why don't we just simply say sometimes science isn't quite as neat and clean as we want it to. Uh, there are some themes that are there, and we kind of suspect they're there, and it's reasonable to suppose that but that we don't actually have it all nailed down. That actually would have been a good science lesson. Um, I feel that a little bit disappointed uh, that we hadn't done more to actually research that problem and actually work it out instead of uh, merely satisfy ourselves with uh, criticizing. Well, Jonathan Wells has 10 projects in his book that he points out haven't been done properly. Oh, yeah, that's true. Um, which one of the 10 do you want him to work on first? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, I, 
I sympathize. It uh, would have been uh, nice if, if, uh, if some intelligent design person would have come through and say, I want to know the truth about all this stuff. Yeah, and where would you get funding for it? And where would you get funding for it? And this is one of the lessons. Mm -hmm. Science is no longer simply a search for truth. It's also a business. Paul? Yeah. Yes. You know, uh, one of the things I've discovered, which is uh, discouraging, nevertheless true, is that I tend to have a selective memory. And the older I get, the more selective it seems to get, which is a matter of great concern. Uh, but uh, uh, this is a common error, and I fully agree with you. This could be a good example of how science uh, uh, could illustrate the problem uh, that you have in science, and uh, that, uh, you should do it. And uh, you know, uh, many many things, and well, uh, you know, many things are not very well known in, in science that are declared to be to be correct. Uh, and this this would uh, help illustrate that. It'd be a very good example. However, I, I must say that uh, they're doing what normal human beings do. We select what we want, and uh, it's a, a lesson for both sides. It is. It is. Well, one good thing is that at least it took some people with, with, uh, with a different world view to point out something that needs to be looked at more closely. And you'll notice that Wells got cited in the scientific literature. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> surprise, surprise. <laughs> I, I'm still not, in the Journal of Evolutionary Biology, no less. Yes. Uh, I'm still not sure exactly how that happened. Um, uh, cited relatively positively, although they did throw in that little thing about how he wants to destroy evolution. Uh, you know, the interesting thing is I don't think Wells is interested in destroying evolution. I think that if there's anything that he wants to destroy, it's... Uh, evolution with the absolute insistence that there must be no intelligent input. But apparently the way they define evolution then must be that it must require no intelligent input. So, you know, step two, then a miracle occurs, is just not allowed in science. I was going to say evolution doesn't do itself any good when it misuses stuff like that, you know, it's, it's not honest with its own data. And so it hurts itself when, once it's discovered. That's true. As creationists, we need to be careful that we don't do the same thing. Because if we did, they would jump down our throats for sure. Uh, and believe me, in certain areas they have. <laughs> Well, with, uh, we're actually going to finish on time and maybe a little tiny bit early. Uh, next week, um, we'll be, oh, we have another comment. So can you pass the mic back? Time filler question. Sure. So what, kind, what did you do in Photoshop to get rid of the arrows? Content aware or clone? Oh. Actually, I went through and uh, erased it uh, using uh, one or two pixel uh, paintbrush. Erased it with a paintbrush? Yeah. Well, now, like our gentleman over here says, there's an easier way. Just use oh. content aware. Oh, I'm, I'm sure there is. Uh, I just didn't happen to have uh, the knowledge or the time to research it last night when I was oh. doing this. <laughs> well, <laughs> it worked well enough. If you didn't, if you didn't uh, know ahead of time that there were arrows that were erased, you, they were almost as well hidden as the uh, bonds themselves. Uh, I'm sorry, I apologize for the facetiousness. <laughs> Still, though, you should use content aware. 
Um, actually, I'll have to learn about that. Actually, I spotted those uh, ghost arrows uh, before I ever saw the moths. Oh, really? Yeah. Interesting. <laughs> yeah, that's, that was what those were. They, they were just, uh, they, were, they were erased. They're, they were erased with, um, uh, with black, and so if you look at it carefully, you can see it's gray and not, not, no color to it. And that's, that's how you can, you can find it if you're looking very, very carefully. But it's tough. The, uh, it's just amazing. I, like I say, I still don't understand how the moths can f figure out that, that if they move in this position, somebody six feet away won't be able to see them. Is there not the, poss is there not the possibility that the um, compound eye of the moth uh, generates a pattern that um, somehow or other the moth um, shuffles around until it, I mean, r remember that, um, that the moths probably are seeing three or four hundred pictures, some of which maybe may include their wings. I don't think there are enough looking at the wings to be able to, to, uh, uh, I could be, you know, one of the things, if you're going to experiment, it will be interesting to see if um, closing off a few of the, the backwards looking ones to see if, see if it, it's actually looking at itself to say, ah, there is a good fit. Yeah, pass it back. Would be somehow or other matching, um, you know, the way we uh, nowadays our cameras focus. They're they're looking for they're not looking for sharpness of the picture. They're looking for edges um, and things of that sort. And maybe the moth's looking for an absence of those things. Uh, well, but you could find out if you made little blinders and stuck them behind so that. The <laughs> 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 Now, there's well, an experiment. I, actually, that's, that's an experiment that would be very interesting to carry out and uh, be interesting to see whether they're actually looking at it or whether there's some other uh, way of doing that. But as was mentioned, alluded to a little earlier, what's to say that they don't have some kind of self-awareness? We know where our foot is. You know, when a horse is walking, he knows where his foot's going to go back there even though he can't see it. He's got some kind of an awareness of what it's doing. Why can't a moth have some kind of an awareness of what his wing design is, of how it blends in? Well, if you keep that up too much, it starts to stretch the imagination just a little bit. Uh, for example, um, okay, we're self-aware. A parrot that can talk to us sometimes sounds self-aware. Might be, certainly, the parrot that we have uh, it's given pretty strong indication that it has a certain degree of self-awareness. Um, dogs are, mm, some of them certainly act self-aware. Um, ants, you're reaching a little bit. Uh, when bacteria have a flagella that, that propels them in a certain direction, it, at that point I'm starting to think you know, self-awareness is probably not the explanation. Yeah, I'm not saying. Yeah, I'm not saying self-aware as I'm sitting there thinking, but you know, you know, when you're there, you kind of have an idea of where your foot is or where something is. You know, a dog. Yeah, a sense of where something is. You know what we should do one of these days? We should review the. Uh, is it a book or an article? I have to look it up. It's called "What Is It Like to Be a Bat?" By Thomas Nagel who's an atheistic philosopher, but it points out that self-consciousness is not something that is easily explainable in evolutionary terms. So uh, next week we'll be talking about abortion, some of the myths involved, and uh, see how far we can get at constructing a rational attitude towards it. And there's several questions we'll have to separate. One of them is, uh, uh, what is, 
uh, what do we mean by murder in the first place? Uh, one of them is, is it really a woman's right to choose her own body? Uh, and, and one of the questions that has to be teased out is the difference between uh, I should never participate in abortions. Um, I should advocate that my church never participates in abortions and it would be nice if my church agreed with me. And then the final one is we should make all abortions uh, illegal on pain of death. Um, where, where do you draw the line between morality and legality? Because we do have that line. And it, there's, it, there's, there are interesting interplays. One of them is with uh, prohibition. Um, and so we'll be exploring several different uh, aspects of the question. And I don't know how far we'll get with that. But um, we'll get at least a half an hour's worth plus discussion. So. Pardon me? We'll start out by defining a parasite. Um, we can start out with that. <laughs> anyway, see you next week. <laughs>